ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming to this event. It's a, it's a relaxed event with booze, so that's always a good start. Uh, and we're going to talk about data. You're going to hear from uh, a very erudite panel that I'll introduce uh, shortly. Um, data saves lives, and it always has done. Uh, we know this from the work that proven the link uh, between smoking and lung cancer, and we know that from the work that debunked the link between uh, uh, MMR vaccines and autism. So data really does matter. Uh, we also know that the public are very altruistic about such things. They give blood, uh, they donate organs, and they donate their data. Uh, in recent surveys, 80% of the public have said they are keen to be involved in data and have their data available for research with some caveats. Some of those caveats may come out uh, today. Uh, and we are on an, the explosion of big data. Uh, I, I saw a startling statistic um, the other day uh, which shows that for a single telemetric device that's measuring blood pressure or um, dispensing insulin, that, P, that device will send 85,000 pieces of data per day back to the mothership. Each one of those pieces of data is something about a patient and the drug and how the body is reacting. So we're at an explosion of big data. So there are some really, really important challenges that I hope um, will come out of our evening today. You're going to hear from our panel There'll then be a chance to refill your glasses, and then we're going to go into debate mode. I know there are lots of people around the room who've got a professional and personal interest in this subject, so please be free with your questions and your comments. Uh, so without any further ado, let me introduce our panel, uh, starting with Professor Liam Smith, who is a GP uh, and Professor of Clinical Epidemiology at the London School of hygiene and tropical medicine, a real life researcher using clinical data in his day job. So he's going to tell us what he needs from this and why it's a, a very good thing. Then we have Peter Knight, who is direct, De Deputy Director at the Department of Health. You were instrumental, Peter, in setting up the Clinical Practice Research Data Link. And, De and Peter's job is to make sure that the system for data flows works well. So any of the issues about how is this data going to flow, how are the safeguards going to work, we hope to hear some of that from, from Peter this evening. And thirdly, we have Sam Smith, who is the coordinator for Med Confidential, and also in his previous life, um, an academic research fellow at University of Manchester. And Sam's particularly involved in ensuring that the privacy and the ethical concerns about the use of data are properly uh, debated, that the public understand them, and that the policies will deliver that. So three very, very erudite uh, speakers. We're going to hear from each of you. They're going to talk for about five to ten minutes. When they get to eight, I'm going to start throwing things in case they don't know uh, to, 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 to keep quiet. Uh, then there'll be an opportunity to refill our glasses, and then we'll go f firmly into questioning mode. So uh, let me turn then to our first speaker, Professor Liam Smith. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I'm going to start with, with my main message, so after the first line you could um, close off for a little bit. But, so my main <laughs> message is that there isn't a debate here. This is about better care with privacy and confidentiality. There isn't a conflict between those two things in my mind. And then I'll start with a serious point. Um, who knows, don't shout out, who knows who recently left One Direction? If you know, put your hand up. Don't shout out. I won't test you, so you can pretend you know. It's all right. Okay, put your hands down. Now, one issue is how do you know that knowledge? I'm talking about knowledge, and you might wish you didn't know, but you do, <laughs> some of you do know. A lot of you don't know, but you could find out in 10 seconds if it was important to you. You could ask a friendly teenager. You could look up on your phones. It's easy to get that knowledge. Now let's think about the Zika virus epidemic that's happening in Latin America, particularly centered in Brazil. Are a major problem is that babies born to mothers who are infected with Zika virus appear to be born very commonly with uh, their heads are grown, they're too small, causing brain damage. And this is, this is an epidemic, and it's a current sort of hottest scientific issue, I think, in the world. And underlying all our efforts to do anything about that, we need to know how big Brazilian babies' heads should be when they're healthy. We have to know that. It's a fundamental thing in all the research on the effects of Zika virus. And the only way we know that is because of health record data. It's the only way we're gonna know that. 
Uh, the data is simple, but it's vital. It's not like you can just look it up. We only know it because of the data. If I bring it but bring to something more local and think about stroke, stroke is a terrible um, you know, bleed into the brain or thrombosis. And London uh, stroke services were dramatically reorganized several years ago on the basis that we know that when you have a stroke, how quickly you get the emergency care you need, how quickly you get the highly skilled scans and treatment you need really contribute to your survival. So we reorganized entirely London Stroke Services. Just as a fundamental point in doing that, we had to know how many strokes happen a year in London. If we didn't know that, we'd, how could you reorganize a service? The only way we know how many strokes happen in London is because of health records data. It's the only way we know it. There isn't another way. You can't just ask someone, because the only way they know it is because of the data. Uh, Shah mentioned the MMR autism, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, and autism. This was actually the first study, big study I was involved in as an academic. And the, the, there was a scare that this vaccine, particularly the measles part of it, might cause autism. Measles vaccine uh, coverage rates plummeted worldwide. There were epidemics in Britain that are still happening now because of that dip. And because we could get hold of people's anonymized, confidential medical data, we and similar researchers in Denmark, similar researchers in the United States, were able to do studies rapidly that demonstrated the safety of the vaccine, restored public faith, and we've seen vaccine coverage return to, to, to the rates we need it to be at. If we hadn't been able to do those studies, if we'd had to go out and individually identify these children, their families, and get consent, for a start, we'd had to have recruited 8 million children and we'd still be recruiting now, we definitely wouldn't know the answer. Public faith in the vaccine would have disappeared altogether. And measles, which kills lots of people, will be back in epidemic proportions around the world. So, is health data special? I think, yes, it is. My data's special. My data's really special. And I want it to be anonymized and protected and confidential. I don't want anyone to have my medical records and know they're mine. And I'm sure that's true of everybody. What we need are, are, are good safeguards. We need approved users who are using data for approved purposes. And already we've got a lot of safeguards in place. It's a criminal act to try and identify someone through hacking into their medical records. I think that's one of the reasons we haven't had a single case of that happening. Um, it's really difficult to try and identify someone from anonymized medical records. I'm not saying it's completely impossible, but it hasn't been done maliciously. Um, if you really wanted to get, you know, someone's secrets and their dirt and to blackmail them or sell them to the newspapers, just hire a journalist, you know, hack their phone or <laughs> something. It's much easier. Go through their dustbins or something. Ha you know, hacking into their anonymized medical records and de-encrypting them and then finding it, it's just not the way to go. So I think health data are vital for high-quality research, high vital for high-quality care, for any of the care that you want to receive. And they're vital if we're going to get the causes of disease, how to prevent disease and better treatments. They've got these data, your data, have got to be used in ways that are adequately safeguarded, kept confidential and private. That's really key. And it's not an issue of using your data versus privacy and confidentiality. The two, for me, go together completely. And we need safeguards in place. We need to keep on the ball. And this is a fast changing field. We've got genomics coming along, and that's going to change everything again. So we need to be constantly on top of our game, making sure we're making best use of the data, and making sure the data are protected and kept confidential. So there was a big fuss made a while ago about um, companies, like insurance companies, getting hold of your data. And I just wanted to clarify one important distinction. I'm not a great fan of the government or anyone else selling your data to anyone, but let's say that insurance companies need to exist, and insurance companies need to know when people in the UK are going to die and what they're going to die of. And that's a perfectly reasonable thing for them to need to know, because they need to know how much it's going to cost them to insure people on a population level. And I think that's an OK, okay use of the data. What doesn't happen, and I would think will be a criminal act anyway, is for insurance companies to get hold of individual identifiable medical records and say, on the basis of what's in your records, your premium is going to be this, or your, we're not going to insure you. That shouldn't happen. It doesn't happen. It will be against the law. But on a population level, these data mean a lot to a great deal of people and can really help things. So it's not for me about is it better care versus confidentiality. 
The two go together. These data are, data are vital for research. They're vital for care. We just need to make sure that privacy and confidentiality goes along with that in the proper use. That's very good. Me. Thank you very much, Liam. It's very rare to go from Zayn Malik to the Zika virus in one open <laughs> sentence, but if I've got the right one direction, Zane Malik. Malik, then that's it. Very good. So, Peter Knight, thank you. You're next. You'd be glad to know there's no one direction Drake's and Whitehall. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what I want to try and do is just give a couple of uh, sort of three bits of, 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 of sort of coverage. One is around context. And I agree with Liam, um, better care or privacy nightmare. Actually, it is better care with privacy and, and security and all those things that everybody comes to expect uh, that we do safely with data. Um, I think the other thing I want to do is think about where the future's going and actually the tsunami of data that's going to hit us in the next few years and how we handle that and the types of data because you know, until the new data protection regulation in Europe starts to take force, we are still operating with data sets which are or data concepts and law which are still rooted in actually, you know, 1948 medical records, which we all, I don't know if you still got Lloyd George envelopes, but you know, the same logic of that. Um, and then the third thing is just to think about the sort of veracity and scape of where data will, will end up and what we will think about doing in the future because it has such great potential to change the way we receive care, the way medicine and new disease um, uh, sort of cures occur and all of that. Um, so current context, we collect a lot of data. Um, I guess a simple pop quiz, how many people do we see in 36 hours in the NHS? Does anybody know? Anybody want to shout a number out? <laughs> go on, you have a go. Uh, 100,000. No, we see a million patients every 36 hours. OK, a million <laughs> patients. And each patient will have a, a, a multitude of data points that are collected by the system about them. Um, and, and the key for that is that that information is so vital in terms of understanding how we can plan services, so we're putting the right resources in the right place, how we can look at research and what we need to do in terms of looking at the epidemiological sort of development of disease and how that comes together. Um, and also to see where prevalence occurs. Um, there's been a lot of work done where you can actually, you know, there was a lot of work done on putting together uh, geospatial relationships between sort of the old incinerators that were pumping out lots of carbons, for fluorocarbons, and then actually where cancer was prevalent and you could see heat maps of how that's changed and you can see it 30 years ago now and as we've cleaned them up you can see the prevalence change so we wouldn't know that without data it's as simple as that and actually that's not relatively identifiable data it's actually quite anonymized data for actually creating the the output of the research in that space so data is a fundamental part of what we need to do now i've done a lot of work over the last number of years myriad of years working with the public and patients around this. And actually, I think there's two things that we really need to learn from that. First of all, when we explain why data is important and why it's useful for uh, uh, sort of the research component of the world um, and also the planning of services, people get it. They think we do it all the time, most of the time, but actually they get it. Um, what we need to be clear about is being transparent about that. And I think those two things are really important that, in that dialogue. So. For the system as it stands at the moment, and I know Sam will talk about care.data, it's that transparency which makes the difference here. Um, and building in, in that in the design, and we were at a citizen's jury last week where this was really, it came out quite strongly, and it's a bit of work that's done by Manchester University, where they'd taken a group of a population and said, look, have a look at this. It's, you know, it's small numbers, but the, the logic uh, plays out with what happened with the Wellcome Trust um, uh, recent uh, uh, review as well um, and report. You know, if, you, if you don't know what you're talking about and you've not had it explained to you, then you don't know what's going to happen. Okay? And then on the other side, when people are taken through what the sort of data journey is and why data is important and what happens, actually people really get it and there's a shift, there's a clear shift for people being comfortable. But I think the one set of words that came out in this conversation for me, and I know a number of people in the audience who were there, were public benefit. What is it that gets the sort of uh, people really understanding this? It's where public benefit occurs, where you as an individual benefit, because you're getting better care and getting better treatments, or more importantly, when, um, when society as a whole sees a better 
uh, sort of application and use of data to, to support disease management across the, the, the sort of the whole spectrum. So I think we have to have that intelligent debate about this because if we don't have both those sides of the coin, it doesn't work. So that covers kind of where the system is at the moment, why we use data, why it's important, what the benefits are. Um, and I think on the other side of the equation is really about what future holds. So this tsunami of data, uh, so how many people have got a Fitbit on in the room? Right, okay. So I'll compete with you on steps now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so the, the, the key point is we're going to have such velocity and veracity of data around at the moment that it can help. I saw from a company over in Israel the ability to take the latest technology from Samsung, put it on your wrist, and they're working on algorithms to say, in 25 minutes, you're probably going to have a heart attack. I'd end up going to A&E if I was you. Now, whether that works or not is a different matter, <laughs> but the conceptual idea of that happening, where you've got enough sensors in one device that can give you predictive analytics about your health, is not too far off. That's the whole point about it. So that, that type of data, that volume of data that's going to come through, we need to deal with. You know, at the moment, how many people know what Fitbit do with their data? Good question. How many people know what Google are just about to propose, as an example? Another good question. Um, and, and actually, what do we do with our data? That's the other point about it. Um, I always r sort of relay the story about how many people use Skype before Microsoft bought it? Everybody? Yeah? How many people just signed the terms and conditions? Did you know what you were signing up for? Did you know, so did you know your computer was going to be a major node on their network and it was going to route calls for you? Because that's effectively what you signed up to in the terms and conditions of the use of that service. Yet yeah, we're prepared to do it. Okay, we're prepared to have that deal and because we want the service. And in the same way, we've got to think about as a society, what our contribution is for health data and what we're going to do with it, and as also, you know, what individually we benefit from that. And I think if we, unless we have those, those sort of real live intelligent debates about this, genomics data, that, you know, the, the identifiable nature of that in terms of, uh, of, of lots of uh, uh, sort of, you know, I can work out in a room that it might be a person that's all nearly 50, grey hair and stuttering at the moment. Um, but you know, you can you can start to get into that sort of that sort of analysis which you couldn't do with just the phenotypic data that we use day in, day out. And putting that together with phenotypic data to look at disease markers, where we're going with different types of science, different types of activities is hugely important. So so we've got to be able to handle that and understand that we've got to be able to know what we will, what we're doing with it. And that's not going to stop. It's going to get more intense, lots more velocity of this data coming. And then, of course, you go to something like the Internet of Things, the whole concept. I've just bought one of those nests. Has anyone else got one of those nests? It's that thing that when I get to Basingstoke, it switches on my heating, and then by the time I get home, the house is warm, and it's all done by a smartphone app, and, and with fridges that will tell you to buy something when you don't want to. Um, but, you know, <laughs> you are going to get... These, these devices coming into, into, into the concept of, of healthcare provision at home because actually the Internet of Things is going to ha enable that type of technology to happen. And we've already seen um, some very interesting experiments where people suffering from dementia and their, their ability to, to manage what they're doing. A really good example of this was a bit of telemetry that was put into a home. And what was happening was um, the patient was basically um, uh, uh, sort of mulling around the house, carers would come in, and what they would do is they'd say, try and feed the patient. Well, the patient wasn't hungry. Why, does, why wasn't the patient hungry? That was the question, why? And actually, with the telemetry, what they worked out until 30, 30 minutes before, the patient basically was going to get some food in the kitchen because there was a lot of activity in the kitchen. So all they did is change the care package for 30 minutes earlier. And surprisingly, that's exactly what had happened. Now, that's technology in its advance that we will have to deal with and we'll have to manage. And we'll have to have that sensible relationship between individuals receiving care, society as a whole, and the knowledge that we're learning about different types of disease management and, and, and development. And research is such a fundamental component of that. 
And if we get that wrong, we're, we're, we're not going to advance science and advance the, the capability of treating people with dignity and with the care they need. So it's really important to do that. Thank you, Peter. Very, very helpful. So you heard Peter talk there about public and uh, the importance of that transparency. Sam, that's your game. Over to you. What do you think about what you've heard? The first thing to say is that if it's a privacy nightmare, it isn't better care. Uh, and at the risk of the panel completely agree on everything, let's toss in some extra things. It's, it's a very nice debate title, and I'm sure you know, Jeremy Hunt sees it as a nice political point. But when it comes down to the front line, the work doctors do day in, day out, sort of political horse exhaust matters a lot less than medical reality. And everybody who wants to use Fitbits can, but everybody being forced to wear a Fitbit would just be weird. <laughs> Yeah, data copying is hard, and the outcomes of that are currently unknown. We have a lot of anecdotes. And we're still waiting for the outcome of the Caldecott review as to large amounts of data. Although NHS England, interestingly, has already preempted that review by requesting permission to have access to, and I quote, have access to de-identified data containing a single identifier. <laughs> that kind of shows how de-identification is kind of used as a sort of magic unicorn and you know, gets us back to how we have better care while also having privacy. And medical care will continue to increasingly take more account of you as a person. If you have a Fitbit, that stuff should be used. It, you know, more personalized medicine, less spray and pray. And there is an argument that says you should only have your genome sequenced once. And it should be kept forever and used for everything. And that's the so-called 50 million genome project. And if people want to do that, the biobank would very much happily have you on their thing. But everybody who's ever had a blood test and then gone back for another one a few days later to see if the intervention you were given works can see that basically sequencing once and keeping it is mostly pointless for when you're actually ill. The NHS probably already knows what blood type you are, but that doesn't mean that you don't get sent for a blood test when you're ill to check the current state and all the other things in your blood that you weren't necessarily expecting. And genomic medicine will turn out to be a lot more like that than it will about some magic bullet that you get once. And sequencing once is really useful if what you care about is a big data system and you're one of the people who sells big data systems. But this debate is about how you get better care, not bigger toys. And genetic sequencing is coming down to the price where it'll be feasible to do everybody, but it'll continue to fall in price. And a couple of years after that, it'll be feasible to test people as and when you need it and throw away most of the results because it's, yeah. You don't need to have it for everybody. And having a database of your entire population's DNA could possibly get used for things. And as I talk, the Investigative Powers Bill has three minutes of debate left. And that data can be used for basically anything that the agencies want if they ask for it. They don't have to ask the Secretary of State. They can just take it. And that's kind of data gets copied. And research projects may ask their target populations to share this sequence of research, all, all their data. And there is always going to be a place for things like the biobank. None of that's going away, but that's for the consented people and admin data coming off the health systems. In terms of accessing data, what Liam needs for his research is lifetime linked medical records. That's what's needed. But if you know one event, that's a key that unlocks the full record. So I walk out of here. I tend not to pay attention when crossing roads. And if I get hit by a bus, I'm sure some of you will be sad and some of you will be amused. And I'll end up at UCLH with, with my medical record coded as probably something like hit by a bus. And that may or may not be what's there, but it's a case of you guys go, oh no, roughly the date, roughly the time, roughly the age, roughly you know, the gender, and how many people got hit by a bus today? Um, and that's relatively common. X71D0 is the code for shot with a crossbow. <laughs> yeah. Individual events are traceable through their lifetime history. And I'm sure you've not all been shot with crossbows, but everybody has something that can be used. And when you've got one and you're looking for somebody, you can get everything. What causes privacy nightmares is not the scale. It's institutional secrecy. It's hiding things from patients that might keep people up at night. And it's you know, one million people taking up the Department of Health offer to opt out of their medical records being shared and then not really do anything about it. 
But the best way for bureaucracies to avoid nightmares is to not do the things that cause them. For clinicians, that's really easy. The clinician talks to the patient, and when the patient objects to something, it doesn't happen. The hard bit and the bureaucratic or commercial nightmare is for those who are far, far away from patients, who don't really like individual choice, don't really like the patient knowing what happened, and yeah, not necessarily actively want to ignore it, but don't actively want to do anything about it. And the patient privacy nightmare comes not from clinicians, but from people who don't want to care about the patient um, and who are looking to do whatever it is they do. And that may be perfectly good, but do we want everything to be done with everybody? Do we all want to be wearing the Fitbit? And that's often not a research agenda. The researchers tend to want to do whatever it is their research is and only wish to research on people who've consented. But they don't want to like, have to deal with that. That's something the system, quote, should take care of for them. Um, and researchers generally work for people. If you want to work for people and to advance knowledge, you go into public service and academia. And if you want to do things to people, you go into business or politics. And it's the business and politics that incentivize doing things to patients. It's why there are currently seven different projects in the NHS, all trying to build a login infrastructure for the entire thing. And none really are getting it right and none are really talking to each other. And you know, care.data was the catastrophic failure because it was doing things to patients, not for patients. If you told patients what you were going to use the data for, they would have to have at least thought about it enough to write something down. And because they didn't want to think of it, they didn't write it down, and then we went off to the races. If you give patients a data usage report, tell them everywhere data about them has gone and why and what was learned as a result, you know, it's a full list with a link to all the papers and all the research. Most people are entirely happy and go, thank you for that, and they will pay as much attention to it as you pay to your bank statement. Yeah, it's nice that it's there, but who checks it every month? And if you want to avoid a privacy nightmare, it's not difficult. Don't keep secrets from patients. Give them information, ask what they think, and do with it. The Wellcome Trust research published last week shows that you can't assume they'll agree with you. But if you're open and honest about it, most people will. And that was the nightmare that covered care.data when they had to suspend the program. And that's still stuck. Every data flow in the NHS can be consensual, safe, and transparent. You can know about it, you can have a choice, and yeah, it can be done safely. And there are certain things you don't get a choice over. Yeah. You, yeah. If you have a notifiable disease, I'm very glad that, you have to be that the authorities have to be notified, and that's a good thing. And that we have a democratic process by which that's how that works. The nightmare is for people is who want to do, two thing, do things to patients where they really hope that the patients don't ever find out about, and that's what hopefully we can avoid in the future. Very good, Sam. Thank you very much. I've got this rather alarming mental thought of being shot with a crossbow for not wearing my Fitbit. So I, I hope that none of us are in that position. What a horrific thought. OK, look, you heard from Liam um, how important research data are for, um, for uh, medical data are for research, for vital for research, vital for care, and vital for prevention. I think a very persuasive case. Peter talked about, goodness, one million people being seen in the NHS every 36 hours. It's a staggering number. And Peter, you talked about how when you talk to the public about it, they get it. So this importance of transparency, but finding uh, the right sweet spot between better data um, and privacy and this sense of public benefit. And Sam, then you talked very much about some of the difficulties in care.data and how important it is to find a consensual, transparent model for the use of this valuable data. What I think everybody agreed with was how important these data are and that how valuable they can be used. So hopefully we'll have a conversation in the discussion period about the how, not the why. I think people have believed that the why is, a, is important, but the how. So look, we're going to uh, have an opportunity to charge your glasses. Before you stampede for the wine, uh, <laughs> use the five or ten minutes while you're have it refilling your glasses to think about some of the questions you'd like to raise, some of the things you've heard the panel say. For example, who should have this data? How will they use it? How will those that want to use it make sure it's used? How will those that don't want their data to be put into the public domain, how can their wishes be respected? Uh, we'd heard a bit about some of the issues around commercial companies having access to data, both for drug discovery and possibly for insurance and marketing 
purposes. We may want to think about that. And then this really interesting debate about the benefit to me as a patient for giving my data or the benefit to society more widely of giving our data. So there are some of the themes I hope we'll refer to uh, in our discussion session. It is, um, gosh, 7.05-ish. Uh, if you want to take 10 minutes to go and grab a glass, chat amongst yourselves, and we'll come back into debate mode at about quarter past. Thanks so much. Uh, there are some roving mics going around. Um, I'd like you, if you, it, uh, please do feel free to ask all questions. Put up your hand. Say who you are. And if you can say that you're representing an organisation, say which the organisation is. But if you can't do that, then just say who you are. Uh, so lots of um, debate, I know, in the room. Oh, my goodness, I haven't even started. Good. So, <laughs> thank you very much. Soul to the man over there. So please, microphone coming your way. Hi, I'm Louis. I work for the British Science Association. Um, you've all kind of touched or hinted at uh, what might happen if my medical data is shared, but I just wanted to get an idea from the panel of sort of what's the worst case scenario. If somebody identifies me from being shot with a crossbow and they get all of the rest of my medical data, could you just lay that out for me in simple terms so that I can understand the very worst case scenario? Okay, perfect, Louisa. How bad could bad be? So let's start. Sam, how bad could bad be? <laughs> <laughs> um, for you, you're not a 15-year-old Catholic schoolgirl on the pill. And you, I know nothing about your medical details, but it's a case of your, you know, there are many things where what should, your community thinks should happen. It's you know, what do you not tell people everywhere? What is the there that you tell people to basically make you better, that you don't necessarily want everybody to know and where they will take action on that behalf. And yeah, that's one example. There are lots of subgroups of um, the population for whom certain things shouldn't do, but that's, yeah, things happen. And yeah, I don't know what the implications will be for you, but there are yeah, a lot of implications people with wives, people with husbands, families, it is not the implications on you that your medical record is on the web, but there are then possibly implications of what do your, the people around you know and how do they treat you differently. And it is that, you know, that is the concern, not, you know, my medical record is basically empty, and if that was on the web, that would be unfortunate, but I would probably not come to significant harm because there's nothing there. But that's because I'm you know, mid-30s male and lucky, not everybody comes into that category. And so that's sort of where you end up. Okay, um, okay thank you, Sam. So, Peter, how bad could it get? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, and I'm, I'm slightly interested in what Sam said, but a couple of points to what you made. First of all, um, my record, an interesting concept. Because we all say my record or your record, okay? It's actually it's information about you. That's the key point, and it's and we kind of look at records as a sort of a construct of, of ownership is quite difficult, okay? So you have actors, you have people contributing, so you have diagnostic tests, you have a whole raft of stuff in there. So then it comes to what type of data is it, and it's personal sensitive, and. How you protect it is, a, is a, an interesting point. So if you're on Facebook, you, your protection is the settings that you're given by Facebook, and off you go and do what you want. And you know, people put lots of information on Facebook, and they live with the consequences of that, or they change it, or whatever. Um, in the same way, you've got personal sensitive data, like your financial data, which you wouldn't want to just generally be out there. But you want your bank to do the transactions that it needs to do to pay people and allow you to buy things. So I think, in essence, if they leaked the data, you would have a concern about it. Um, but you've got to remember, and I go back to what Liam said, that the amount of this stuff that happens is so minuscule, and certainly in research terms, I can't think of a single case where it's happened, actually, because um, the privacy issues and the bars that everybody goes through to get access to data is so high, you have to demonstrate a lot of things. Um, and actually access to data through things like the Information Governance Toolkit that's in the system is a, is a mechanism for making sure that the security and all the things that you'd expect to be in place in there. Um, 
And the question comes, what if you share your record as an example? And that could be a future position where you want to donate what's in your record to something, but actually, what do the recipients do with the data and what's the deal that you have with it? So I think, how bad could it get? It, it goes back to that point, how harmful could it be, is the question. And not knowing anybody in the room and not knowing anything about them, you, you can't make that judgment. It's a personal judgment for you. You've also got to remember, if you feel as though you've had harm, you've got legal recourse. So you have got both the courts and the Data Protection Act on your side in that space. So the protections are there. It's just a matter of you know, how far do you feel distressed by what's happened? That's the question. So let me come to Liam. Liam, um, the question, you know, how bad did it get? But we know that systems aren't perfect. You just have to look at Talk Talk to know that systems break down all the time. Yeah, yeah. How worried should we be? Um, well, how bad could it be? Really bad. Um, I would hate my medical record to be. It's not. It's pretty boring too. But I still hate it to be on the web. Um, why would anyone, you know, I, I'm the sort of person who might possibly be able to do that. Why would I? I'm sure you're absolutely fascinating, but. I can't really think why I would want to. Might someone want to undertake criminal activity and do it? Possibly. Um, how would they do it? It would be difficult. Very difficult. Uh, you've got other things to worry about that I would worry about instead. Um, it would be much I easier. I don't think that was you, Louis. But yeah. it, was a more general it would be much easier to get into your bank account and publicise that. It would be much easier to find every email and social media message you have yeah. ever sent in your whole life, including all the ones that you've deleted from any system where you were ever <laughs> logged in as possibly identifiable as you, and every computer IP address that you've ever owned. That would be much easier to get hold of and publicise. So there are things to possibly worry about, but I wouldn't worry about people who aren't very interested in you getting hold of your medical records. Worry about a few other things first. Great. Thank you, Louis. I've got loads of hands up. <laughs> so I've got a uh, lady here and then gentlemen there. So microphone's coming your way. Thank you. Hi, my name's Julia, and I'm just a member of Joe Public who finds these events absolutely fascinating. Right. And it's a bit related to that, really, because I, I suddenly had a mem memory triggered in the first thing of an extraordinary letter I got from a South London hospital where I'd had a couple of um, consultations. This is about three or four years ago, telling me that um, my medical records were among some that had been stolen from this room. And they, they went to great pains in this letter to say it was in a locked room that was only accessed by, you know, swipe codes, this, that and the other. And I was left thinking, oh, what am I meant to do about this? I mean, if you're, and I don't know, so why would anyone want my records? You know, is it identity theft? Is it whatever? And I never had another letter. So I don't know, should I be worried? Should I? And I've never been back to, back to that hospital and somebody said to me, well, that's funny, you came last week. You know? So <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> So I'll, I'll ask Peter to answer that question with your Department of Health hat on. Yes, I, 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 I also used to run a trust, so I know a little bit about this space in that sense. And my Fitbit's just telling me I've done 10,000 steps. It lies, How did that work? It lies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so, so where human error occurs, you do get this thing, and you do get malicious damage like that happening. Now, this was a, probably around, it sounded like paper records, uh, which is the key thing. And paper records, um, you can, that, that just has, it, it's, a, it's a thing that happens, people do lose records. I've got the feeling it might have been a disc, but I wish, I wish I'd thought before I came, I could have dug out the letter for accuracy, yeah. but anyway. Even if it's a disc, and it, 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 it's a physical thing that they would have to take, that's the key point. And you do get people doing that sort of thing. Um, you can't always protect everything all the time, that's just a consequence of life. Um, I, I, the bizarre thing about it, though, is if it's on a control computer system, it's a much more auditable, much more controlled, actually. Um, and one of the things I found when we moved from what was records that were distributed and very much dispersed and paper-based to um, sort of records on a centralised computer system within the hospital that controlled and there were lots of control mechanisms around it, is the instance of those things happening diminished quite dramatically because the safety and control is much better. And actually, I think we shouldn't be frightened of that change between what is a manual record system and a digital record system. The danger, which everybody always talks about, is that actually if you do get into the, into the digital record system, there's just lots more data there, but it's darn sight harder to do so 
And I think that's really important to recognise that trade-off. So nothing's risk-free, but there is a level of risk, and it's the it's the sort of the, the, the issue to do with whether you know it's a vast quantity of data or just a small amount. And those things need to be investigated. I've got to say, now the structures of this are very, very strongly controlled with um, uh, trusts being accountable for that. That doesn't say there's still no breaches, uh, and that's really important to recognise because that's just the world we live in. But the Information Commission is actually very good at finding these things out and dealing with organisations individually where there have been failures. Okay, thank you. So, gentlemen here, and then if we can keep the microphones coming to people, have the lady in red next. Uh, I'm Arne Walters. I'm data manager at the Health Foundation. Um, interestingly, I totally agree with you that probably your bank details, your Facebook, your Twitter, everything that you have a username and password to is much easy, more easy to hack than uh, health data being kept in a secure research environment used for specific purposes with a lot of controls around them. Therefore, I was wondering what your view is about electronic patient records being available online uh, through a portal provided by your GP practice, and the only thing stopping people from accessing that is actually your own username and password, which is as easily hackable as it is to get into your Facebook account. Yeah, so who would like to take that question boldly? You point at me. No. Uh, you're, yeah. you're, you're the GP. <laughs> A bit of risk transfer uh, there, so we'll go to Liam. I think it's an example of this being an ever-moving picture. You know, we've got to keep up with the times here. So uh, I can think of myself as a, as a human being and as a, as a doctor and think, hey, it's great, patients having whole, being able to look at their medical records whenever they want, having them online for whenever they are useful, whether they're in, you know, on holiday or whatever. That's great. Uh, that seems like a good use of technology. So then we've got to think, okay, what are the threats? And we've got to make, put, in, you know, put in place adequate security, let people know what risks they, they would be taking. And we, we have to rethink things and probably like a kind of you know, email, username, and password, it probably isn't good enough for most people. I don't think it'd be good enough for me, personally. So we, we need to move with the times here and think of a better, better, better security. I think it's a great idea, but I think we probably need some new, new things to do it. Sam? So looking at what is the state of the art for access, username and password probably isn't enough, but equally there is... Um, steps that you can take to protect and busy your record and it's you know, a process of you know, is this turned on for everybody or is this just turned on for people who want it because most people won't care um, and some of going back to the point about the letter and that it's what level of information do you want what did that letter say that it should have didn't say that it should have said what is the you know is this you only hear about problems or do you hear about everything and as you provide more information you end up starting to um, sort of raise the level of knowledge of what's going on. And if you can see when you logged in and you know that your username and password hasn't been abused and your account access hasn't been uh, attacked, then that's useful to know that nothing bad has happened, which is an absence of a problem, which while it necessarily doesn't, it you know, may give false reassurance on your password 1234 is fine. Well, it probably isn't. Um, but it's a case of you can at least see what had happened and sort of raising the level of knowledge as to this is what happened to your records. Reducing the surprises is probably as important as anything else. Okay, lots of people worried in the room that Sam's got their password. Peter, do you want to come in? Yes. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm going to be the, uh, I was the, one of the few people that when it was possible to do it, I went and said, I would like to do it. Thank you very much. And, and, and all right, I might be an early adopter, but that's fine. The question is, what's the risk benefit to me? Okay, and that's the question I ask myself. Um, and the benefit is I can see what's in my record. And if I did it any other way, I'd have to put a subject access request in and I'd have to wait for the GP to send the record to me and it would just take a whole lot of time. I, I also did internet banking when it first came out. Okay, And, and as, as that's developed, that's got more and more secure with the new techniques and models that can happen. So I think there's a process of learning that most organisations go through on this. I think the, when Coltecott comes out, there'll be some uh, views on that in that area. Um, but it's, it's about making sure you've got the proportionate right security levels in, that you put the right authentication in. I mean, I, I remember the first one I had from a bank, they'd sent me one of these calculators that I lost. You know, what do you do with that? And now they've got more sophisticated where they give you mobile phone apps, which then link to the sites and things like that. So you can see the generation of security getting better and better and better. Um, I have to say, though, uh, talking to academics in the States where, you know, 
as much security as put in as many people want to try and hack. The question is why they're hacking, and it goes back to Liam's point, what's the value in doing it? Financially, there's a huge amount of value to drain your bank account. Medically, unless they want to blackmail you, unless they want to try and target you, there's very little advantage in that sense. So, yeah. Okay, so I've got the lady in red, and then I've got the lady in red. So, <laughs> <laughs> solve that problem. Yeah, please. Um, my name's Jennifer Boone. I'm from the policy team at the British Heart Foundation. Um, so I have quite a broad question. Something I work on a lot is health inequalities, so different outcomes for different groups. And I think the interactions between the use of patient data and health inequalities are pretty interesting. So we've talked about Fitbits. People talk about how a lot of people use them. A lot of people do, but they tend to be from specific groups. We sometimes talk about people being able to edit their own records. That's something that you would feel much more able to do if you're confident you have the access. And then similarly, when we're communicating about the issues, when you look at the level of literacy and the level of numeracy in the UK population as a whole, there's a difference between communicating with the people who are most engaged with these issues and communicating with everyone. So I was just wondering if the panel could give us some thoughts on how we can maybe improve rather than worsen health inequalities by using large data sets. And particularly your point, Jennifer, is about how to, um, how to get to those people who aren't the normal people that would come to a talk science event. Yeah, yeah. and who maybe aren't monitoring their yeah. health. Perfect. So, Sam, do you want to start with that? Sure. Um, I think, as a National Health Service, it has to work for everybody. And that's not the people who are engaged, it's everybody. Which means, if you don't do anything, that you're, you are not put at risk. You know, Care.data exploited a million people opted out, and they probably shouldn't have had to go through the rigmarole of doing it. And they did that because of their, but equally, if you look at the opt-out rates, you are entirely right, it is the more engaged, the more thing. Um, there's a, dot, the organisation Dot Everyone is doing some work around the NHS, and the phrase they use is reaching the furthest first. And the inverse care law completely applies to digital stuff. How do you help the people who are least uh, engaged? How do you help them who are at the lower end of the socio-economic scale? And that will have dramatic impacts on helping um, NHS budget pressures and everything else for various reasons. And you are entirely right. And they cannot be forgotten and they must be prioritised because if you can read your own health records, you may do so. But the people who are going to do that are either already receiving a lot of care and interested or just looking. It's the people who are busy raising their families and doing a bunch of other things that, you know, the NHS should help in a way that they don't have to particularly engage with at a detailed level. But the underlying question, I think, there is also people who are less literate, less digital literate. Yeah. How do you get them to really understand uh, the information around transparency about how their data will be used so that when they consent or decide not to opt out, mm -hmm. that decision is truly informed? Mm -hmm. What's your sense about that? I will. Um, I hope that the Caldecott review and the subsequent consultation covers that. Um, there is no position yet on what the question should be. Once there is a consensus on is this the right question, well how do you explain that in a way that the public can understand? And I don't think that work has begun looking vaguely at Peter to give me a clue either way. Uh, and it's a case of you know, if it's too complicated, it's not going to work. And one of the processes around care data was, if we don't tell people make it really hard, it's not going to work. And when they find out and people get really unhappy, they will go through quite extensive lengths. And there are things that can be taken on for particular populations. But look, I would very much like to be in a position where the data sharing was safe and consensual and transparent. And the charities could say, you know, we have full confidence in you doing this for, if you're, for whatever your issues are. And that's different from the British Heart Foundation to cancer to all the others. And I think that's somewhere where I think the charities hoped they were two and a bit years ago, and it turned out not so much. OK, so would either of you like to come on this point? Should that inform consent transparency, consent your use of data? Yes. I'm, I'm right yeah, thank Quite. you. So I, I think this raises a really important issue, OK, because I, I think health inequalities has, has got to have a way of being addressed in some way, shape, or form. Um, and, and the question in this space for me is how do you get the right mechanisms and media in place to do that? Because, um, and I, I, I relate it to a personal way of looking at this, okay? So, um, and I, I, I got a, 
I, I ended up engaging to an anti-coagulant clinic for a while. And what struck me about that is we don't use the technology that's in people's hands today, no matter what part of society they come from, okay? The health system just doesn't do that, and it comes back to what we were discussing earlier. So I, I, did the, I did the paper thing, which is, we're going to take your blood, we'll give you, you will take your paper away, we'll mark it up, and we'll tell you what it is in four days' time, and then we'll give you the book back, and you'll be on this trajectory of medication. And there's a great piece of work actually in North West London which has looked at this where they've literally transformed it by saying, you've got a mobile phone. Mm. Well, we're not going to do it that way, we're going to do it this way now. Okay? Um, and, and basically they connect the person up to the, ind- into the hospital or the, the unit that's doing this. They give them the tools to do the job effectively, an INR test and a mechanism for recording stuff and other you know, Bluetooth devices. That created the inequality bridge in a sense, i.e. it because I sat in that clinic as a person dressed in a suit, the only person dressed in a suit, okay? And everybody else was either very old or, you know, you could see there was sort of, it was a different sort of structure. And, and, and whether I'm prejudiced or not is not what I'm talking about here. It's just the fact that actually everybody had a mobile phone. Everybody had a device that could have something like that on it. And yet we weren't using that technology to bridge that inequality, which is frustrating, I think, is the, the key point. And, and the more we get to that level of inequality bridge, where people will actively know what, what you're doing with that sort of in, intervention. And I think most people can see that actually, when you explain it in that sort of way, and then you start to translate that to, well, actually, we did that by research, which we need bigger sets of data to look at inequality, people get it. And, and I think that, that dialogue, that public dialogue, that way of explaining it is really important. And use real things, not... <coughs> hypothetical things, because I think that's the, the big change, really. OK, thank you. Liam, on health uh, inequality. Yes, yeah, slightly different note. It's, just a, it's actually a research <laughs> finding. <laughs> Always good to disseminate a research finding. Um, <laughs> in using anonymised data. This was just something we came up with last week. So when people have diabetes, it really matters what their sugar level is, and that gets recorded in your medical records. And we did this big, and it's of huge international importance, and there's huge debate about what the best level is try and get the wood diabetes where their sugar is. There are international conferences about this. People have, you know, scientists are always heated debate. I've been invited all over the place to, and this is obviously this huge debate. And we did a study using anonymized records, looking among people with diabetes at their sugar levels and who had the worst outcomes in terms of heart disease and deaths. And we were interested in all sorts of things. Is it 6.5, is it 7, is it 6.2, and all this sort of stuff. And then we were interested in ethnicity, and is it worse for people of South Asian origin, and all this sort of stuff. And what came out of that, because we had measures of socioeconomic status based on uh, completely anonymised of where people live, and people live in poor areas or rich areas, we didn't know where they were, we just knew whether they were very poor, middle, or rich. And what came out far more important than anything was having missing data. So the fact that you weren't getting your blood sugar measured by your doctor, so you weren't turning up to be blood sugar measured, was far more important than any of the biology, which is there have been huge international conferences about whether it should be 6.5 or 6.8, yeah? What really kills people is just not having it measured. And guess who wasn't having it measured? People lived in the poorest areas. And we just got that from anonymized data, millions of records. And uh, it just, you know, so the, the, just, the, just not going to the doctor to have your blood sugar measured sweeps away all the biology. And all these international conferences could turn their attention to how do we get poor people to come and get their blood sugar measured. Okay, thank you. That, that's the research line. So I've got a lady there, I've got a lady behind there, and then I've got a gent in a check shirt on that side. So please. Hi, my name is Lara Grown. Um, I've been a critical care nurse. I've also worked in the pharmaceutical industry as a project manager in clinical trials, so I get the whole anonymised data bit. I've lived it for more years than I'd care to count. Um, relating to Jennifer's point as well, I think for me, um, as with many things within our healthcare system, which, which are great, we need to take the emotion out of the equation. And for me, I guess the question is, what's the best point of access for perhaps the less literate, educated uh, population is it the GP's office the, the arms will go up in the air but you know with the new changes and clinical commissioning groups GP's offices are inundated blah 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 we also have a wealth of very well educated informed 
volunteers that perhaps could help man some kind of initiative, whether it's giving out an information sheet, but discussing it for those people who perhaps their reading skills aren't as great as they could be, that kind of thing. I think the biggest thing is if we take the emotion out of the equation and clearly explain, as you do in a clinical trial informed consent or an academic informed consent, the purpose, the risk, the benefit, I think the general lay public will be more open to having their data anonymized, encrypted, however you want to deal with it, in relation to research and the healthcare system, and are perhaps are more wary when the big government word comes into play. You know, big brother is watching you, blah, 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 blah. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, some very interesting points there raised by Zara about uh, uh, tackling, taking the emotion out of things, but also a very interesting comment about GPs. GPs are busy, they're under pressure, they've got loads of stuff. And last time in care.data, it was GPs also who were reluctant to have data shared uh, or their patients' data shared. So um, I think there is something there that the panel should comment on. I don't know whether PT wants to go first to talk about particularly the G getting GPs on side. So, Sam. Okay, so I, I, I've got. Well, I'll ask you to be brief because we've got loads of. Sure, sure. Guys. So I, I actually, I, it's interesting because I welcome what the BMA has done recently, which is get together and, and just think about this whole conundrum of of sharing or not sharing yeah. and getting a policy together which is consistent. Because the BMA has, is, is composed of two different types of groups. There's the academics, as, as Liam would be uh, on, the, on the side of, but also he's a GP, so, and there's GPs. And they, they have different views. And we have a, almost a patriarchal sort of model of, of wanting to protect our cohort of patients. Um, but at the same time, we need to think about disease management and disease prevalence and how do we get to the cures we need to get to. So there's that conundrum we have to deal with. And I think, for me, I think that change of view from the BMA and, and how they're trying to be sort of consistent in their thought process around this policy is helpful. And I hope that has a sort of cascading effect into the environment because, yes, GPs are busy, but GPs also look after patients every day. And it's, it's their advantage to know what, what's the best treatments and should be there for individuals, whether they're novel treatments that are just coming through the pipeline or whether they're really well-established things which people can deal with. So I think you need, that's the yeah. balance. Okay, yeah. Sam, getting the GPs on side. They were right. They were right. Um, yeah, if the, clini yeah, the clinicians are the people who the patient primarily trusts, and it may be five seconds of clinician time, go talk to the nurse about this, but it's a case of if the clinicians aren't on board, you're probably fighting the one fight. Okay, let him finish his sentence and you can come back in. Go on, finish your sentence. I, I you have finished your sentence. Go I, on. I, I find this quite interesting because having dealt with patient groups on this, there's a lot of patient groups who say, I don't want the GP to do that screening for me, thank you very much. And I, I think we, 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 let's, let's not try and be black and white about this mm -hmm. because actually there are lots of shades of grey around this and there's a lot of active, positive patient groups who actually find GPs being a barrier to getting into that structure. And I think we have to we have to listen to all those voices. We can't just have one dilemma on this. Okay, so we listen to patients and we listen to doctors. So I have the lady there, and then the gent in the check shirt, please. Hello, my name is Susie Urch. I'm a philosophy student from King's College London, and I, I think it's um, arguably we have a moral duty to prevent harm to others. And as all of you have said tonight. Um, we have the ability to give away our data and save many lives or improve many lives. But obviously there's the conflict with privacy and we want to keep our privacy or maybe we just don't want to know about ourselves and we have that right not to know as well. So I was wondering if you thought we have a moral obligation to share our health data um, and if so, in what cases? Uh, so do we have a moral obligation to get our genome sequenced so that people with rare genetic diseases can discover the cause of their disease? Or do we have a moral responsibility to share our genetic information with our partner who we plan to have children with so that they can decide if they want to have children with us? <laughs> how, how far does the moral obligation go and in what cases does someone have a moral obligation and what conditions may exempt someone from a moral obligation. Sorry, lots of no, information. Great, there. great, great question. Very, very oh, great. thank you. Thank you. 
thank you. Award a prize for the best question. Oh, thank you. So I'm doing my dissertation on this. So I'm <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Here first, you can cite us. So, uh, so, so Susan's question is about the moral obligation to share data. Right? When you when you respond to that, I think all three panel members do respond to that. Also, try and tackle the issue of opt out. If it is a moral obligation, do people have the right to opt out? So, let's go that way. So we'll give some time. Uh, so we go from take the emotion out to more yeah, obligation. Exactly. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I have some friends who have HIV. And some of my friends believe that HIV should be a chronic condition like anything else. Shouldn't, you know, and they publish their medical records because they want this condition to be made less bad and sorted and treated faster. And I have other friends who also have HIV who have the opinion that there is social stigma around it, there would be direct harm to them if people are around, and they want to keep kept it completely siloed. And the thing is, they're both right. There is no way to do this at generic levels. So in terms of how do you do the right thing for everybody, the individual has to have some level of choice. And as to whether or not you should, I have a friend who's a investigative journalist, uh, uh, investigative journalist looking at pharma and pharmaceutical bribing and corruption, and um, hopefully they don't see me GSK. Um, and it's a case of how do they protect their family? Because everyone knows that that one of their family has a condition. It's relatively rare, and known enough. How do they basically protect their medical records from going to the people they are currently investigating? And there are lots of other odd cases like that, domestic violence of, of the ex-wife of a medical researcher. You end up with a bunch of things. And the only way to deal with that is that the people who are concerned for the whole range of idiosyncratic reasons that humanity comes up with have to be able to take steps, otherwise you end up having to deal with that at a population scale, which means you can't do anything because all of those could be anybody and you end up not being able to send data anywhere because you're terrified of relatively rare occurrences. And in some ways the opt-out rate is how many people got nervous about what you were doing. And officially the care.data figure is about 3%, it spikes to 15 um, And it's a case of the better you do, the more safeguards you put in place, the more confidence you build, the smaller that number should be that's basically a short version of what may be your dissertation. I'm happy to chat afterwards if there's more detail. No money to change hands, though. So, Peter, is there a moral obligation and where does the opt-out sit? So, the moral dilemma. Um, thanks for that one. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting because it, you, you've got to start with moral context, and I think that's, that's really important. And depending on what your, your, both your context is for the nation that you live in and the the individual, it becomes a very interesting position. So I'll oh, just think about the negotiations around the general data protection regulation, where if you go north of us into the, the sort of Nordic states, their moral obligation is to share everything and they get on with it. You go south, it's you don't, okay, because of history and all sorts of things. So there is a, there's a context, and I think that's really important to recognise. Um, I think there's that debate between what you as an individual take out of society and put into society versus what society does. And that's a really difficult line because there's lots of different views on that and everybody in this room will have, you know, there's 150 people so there'll be 150 different views about that. Um, I, think, I think there are three things that I think were important. I think there's, there's the moral obligation which uh, allows you to contribute to society which is your choice about the level that you take to that. Um, uh, however, I think that moral obligation in an educated society is much higher than it is anywhere else in that respect. So contributing your data to doing something worthy of and research actually is worthwhile. The next obligation is that society maintains and manages that appropriately, and I think that's their moral obligation. And then finally, uh, you know, if we don't have that sort of deal on the table in a sense, um, what we end up with is either stagnation in what we try to do or we get complete chaos and actually what we need is a balanced view of it. So that view saying actually there's a value in what we do as a collective, a society, contributing my data, contributing my genome, um, or, and there's also that point about which actually 
you need some protection. And I agree with you on your, your friend who's got it, I've got a similar friend, where they've got so different views about it, you kind of go, well, which is the, which is the right one or not? Um, you know, that, that's, that's the subject for the moral maze, I think. OK, Liam. Uh, I'll try and be brief, but I'll start with going to the, back to the beginning of humankind. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and there we were, hunting and gathering, and then we invented, you know, agriculture, so it meant we could stay in one place, and we, so therefore cities started to be developed, and we, everyone realised they're really social beings, and we like living in societies with other people, with other people, and we get huge benefits from that. Um, does that bring with it uh, responsibilities? I think it does. Are they, should they be legally obliged? Uh, I don't think so. What I would like to think is that we can make <coughs> sharing your data for the common good a cultural norm. Um, so I'd like it to be a cultural norm. So, if, you know, um, let's take, take it out of health, just to be slightly less emotive about it, but going to education, which it should be as emotive. Um, so, people's kids' SATs results and their test results and their exam results are used by Department of Education to look at how schools in different areas are doing and all this kind of thing. Might a parent legitimately want to opt their particular child results out of that kind of analysis? I, I guess probably yes, there probably would be some, and probably they should be allowed to. Um, I, I hope they don't. I hope no one feels the need to do that. I hope people feel it's a cultural norm that we use these data for the common good. We use these data to figure out if vaccines are safe and what's the best way to treat stroke. Do people who have opted out of having any of their data involved in that, in that process, should they not be allowed to have those vaccines? Should they not get the latest stroke treatments? I think they probably should. You know, I think it's okay. Just let's just hope that 99% of people buy into it and it becomes a cultural norm okay. rather than a legal obligation. <coughs> let's just do a straw poll in the audience. Who thinks it is a moral obligation to share your data? Uh, the risk of sound like Jonathan Jimbo. It's about a half. About a half. So 50% think not. We've got obviously more work to do to persuade people of the value of the cultural norm. So I think I've got. The gent in the check shirt, and then I've got a um, gentleman there. Yes, good. So, have you got a mic? Hi, I'm Josh, PhD student at the University of Manchester. Um, you've spoken a lot about the Fitbit, and you mentioned that app, which can tell you if you're going to have a heart attack. And um, I'm just thinking it, obviously, these health apps are very profit-based. So, looking at it from the other side, what is their, these companies' obligation or responsibilities to give the information back to the individual that provides it? Okay, this is a very good question. And I think um, uh, you referred, Peter, to the Wellcome Trust report that was published last week, which said yeah. that people are very keen to share their data, but the thing they're most worried about is industry and particularly for sort of non-medical uses. So, really live issue. What do we think about this? Who would like to come in on this point? Industry. That was a yes. So, I got Peter and then Sam. Oh, and then Liam. Very yeah. good. Happy to. Do you want me to kill? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, 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 so I'm the guilty party for introducing Fitbits and apps and things like that. Um, so, it's an interesting dilemma, this, because actually you buy, you, the health service doesn't give you a Fitbit, you buy one. You, you buy it, you enter into the deal with Fitbit, and you sign up to the terms and conditions of it. Um, the question is, what do you demand out of that? And, and, and that's the interesting question, because at the moment, there's no right for anybody to, you know, you, I have no right to have a look at your data and see what is happening on Fitbit. You choose to do it between you and friends, and Fitbit has some sort of legal view about what it can do with your data for analytics and all that. I guess this is a dilemma which we're going to have to face about how we deal with it, because um, I know Google at the moment are thinking about their equivalent to what Microsoft used to have of Health Vault. You know, you lodge your stuff in there, and then you have a right to decide where you're going to share that to. But at the top of the end of the deal, you know, they've got a right to do some analytics over you. So I think that's going to be an interesting sort of trade that you make. Whether we get into that in terms of how the health service deals with that or not is yet to be worked out, understood, defined in some respects. Um, I guess my biggest concern in all of this is how reliable is that information and what's the provenance of it. That's what, what I'm always going to be worried about because I think we were discussing, no, it wasn't, it was another friend of mine uh, earlier today, where we were discussing, you know, these are actually, they've got some 
quality around them and there's some structure around them where you can go and buy the ones from China, which are just a sort of, you know, a, 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 a sort of a cheaper version of this, which we don't know, are they accurate? What's the testing that's being put around them? You know, what's all of that sort of stuff? And there's going to be a dilemma around this at the moment. I think you're right. So the question, the question really is, and you may want to come back or we may hand it over to Sam, is if we have assessed that there probably is a cultural norm or a moral obligation to share these data, but then these data are used by companies for potentially profit-making mm-hmm. things, does that change our rubric? Does that change the way we look at it? Well, I, I don't think Welcome found that. What Welcome found is if you sign up to Facebook, you know you're doing the deal with the devil in their head. You know, that's the sort of deal you're doing because you want the service. That's what you want. So you're prepared to do that trade with this empire of, uh, of, of, of Facebook incorporated and all that. Uh, I think the, the dilemma comes, everybody sees the NHS as a good thing generally, and therefore would it do the same sort of deal? And that's a really big dilemma. And, and I think um, we've got to find a way through that that's, that gives that right balance, because I think that's a difficult area. And as I say, you're starting from the other end of the spectrum where you're signing up with the company who's created them, not the other end of the spectrum where people are bringing stuff in. So, Sam, we give our data to the NHS. If it goes into ministry, how worried should we be? Um, I think there's a a thing, you know, you chose a Fitbit, you didn't choose one of the Fitbit competitors you could have done, and there's some market um, forces there. But it comes down to context. You give your data to Fitbit for that sort of thing. If it suddenly started showing up on Twitter randomly because every so often it tweeted it and you had no control over that, you get quite unhappy. But it's a case of, and you may give it to the NHS for your care. How much of that, and that is a, yeah, going back to the previous very good question, is, is part of the settlement. And there's a pharmacy called Pharmacy to You. And basically they had buried in the terms and conditions that if you click through two links and two checkboxes, you could opt out of them selling your names and addresses. And the people who bought the names and addresses is actually quite interesting, because they weren't after 20-somethings to sell little blue pills. The people that they, uh, the people at the front of the queue for this data were Australian lottery fraudsters and um, fake medicine peddlers. Um, and you know, it's like, why were they there? And they weren't asking for the 20-somethings. They were asking for the over 70s. They were asking for the people with impairments. And so some of the uses that this data goes to in the first instance is probably going to be maybe places you didn't want it to go and how much attention did you pay. And there's going to have to be some form of assessment made as to, you know, one of the bits of work that was at a meeting Peter and I were at this more uh, early today, was what should happen about apps and these devices. And it's currently a mess because nobody's quite sure how it plays out. And what should the rules be for, you know, should you be able to get a Fitbit on the NHS because it's cheaper and easier than measuring everything. But well, what happens to that data and who gets any say in it? And should you have to, you know, everybody agrees, if you're going to use Facebook, you have to give your data to Facebook. That's how the system works. Is, you know, if you want your um, kidney function to be measured, should you have to give it to the company that sold the NHS the kidney machine? Mm-hmm. And some of them do, and some of them don't, and the, and the NHS gets a discount if they hand all of the personal data over to the company that made the, the kidney machine. <coughs> and if we, keep, if we keep ignoring the question, you will end up making rules based on pharmacy to you who sold data to people they probably shouldn't have. And I think, you know, addressing that in a much stronger way is probably necessary, but it's probably not going to happen until there's another disaster. Okay, let's hope it's not that, Liam. Um, I'll talk about a specific example, uh, big pharmaceutical companies. Now, um, I'm sure there are some really nice people who work in them, and uh, (laughs) I'm sure there are some really horrible people who work in them, and they do lots of horrible things, but uh, I would probably prefer if it wasn't the case, but only pharmaceutical companies can afford to develop new drugs. The world's running out of antibiotics that work. We need new antibiotics to work. If I get some resistant infection, I want a new antibiotic that works. Only pharmaceutical companies are going to be able to provide that in the future. So should they be allowed to use my data to help them? Uh, I think probably yes. Of course, they should on an anonymized basis in a population way for population benefits. Should they be allowed to have my data 
knowing it's me, in order to sell my data to someone else, in order to do something to me, like sell me personally their drug, or whatever it is, no. I'm very clear on that. So I think it is a matter of, you know, if you want the benefits, you take, you take the small risks that are there, and you take, you take the you know, possibly unpalatable things. But it's about distinguishing sort of potentially sort of quite individual harms, which I think we can control and get rid of. And saying, OK, that's OK, we can use your anonymized large-scale data for public benefit, then I think, I think it's OK with these companies. I don't think we've got much choice. So, Sam, come back briefly. Yeah, yeah. and I think you know, you're entirely right that the people who do the research of things, why are we running into antibiotics? We had one, and then the commercial incentive of the pharmaceutical marketers was to feed it to pigs so that they didn't get sick, and then we got um, antibacterial resistance for the last remaining antibiotic. It's not just the research, there are a bunch of commercial imperatives here which are not let's make the human race safer and healthier. It's a lot of the time, it's how do we make money in the short term. Okay, we may have other questions for the commercial imperatives. Just At warp speed. Warp speed, just the citizen's jury, actually, the, the, the dialogue there, which is going back to what Liam's mm. saying, is actually when people understand what, why pharmaceutical companies need that population data, they very quickly move into that space of saying actually that's a good public benefit. It's the other stuff that they don't want the insurance companies and the, the way that you know, individuals could be uh, focused on per premium and stuff okay. like that. Hi, I, I'm Piers Allen. Um, I'm a school governor, uh, local councillor, and member of a health and wellbeing board. And I wondered um, what we should perhaps be uh, sort of um, saying to our children at, uh, in, at PSHE le uh, lessons at primary and secondary school. And uh, is there a role perhaps for health and wellbeing boards as a local health system leaders to perhaps try and say it, rather than Nikki Morgan as Secretary of State for Education. Okay, so what should we tell the children? Get them young. I'm going to ask the panel to be really brief because I know there are other questions. So, Liam, what should we tell the young? I think the most important thing is that, that an individual's health data is, as we've talked about, is just one part, and in the future, just one small part of their important digital existence. And so this is a part of, so you, you know, your health data are private, they're confidential, there may be situations where they get used in an anonymized way, in the same way, I think they, the young people need to know everything that's going to happen to all their bits of data. All those Snapchat things that they think disappear forever and don't actually disappear forever. Everything. There's so much for them. It's a bit overwhelming, there's so much for them to learn. And it's moving so quickly. I think we've got no choice. And certainly, and I would have put the health data in there as a kind of, this is part of the new digital world they're going to grow into. Okay, thank you. Please, so, so as we educate children on citizenship, we should educate them on data use, and I think that's really important. And I also think we should educate them on why research is important, actually, because mm -hmm. um, those are the fundamental things that change people's cultural norms over time. So those are the things I would be focusing thank on. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, um, very briefly, um, people who are digitally native and very young actually look at this actually slightly differently. Um, you know, they see the, the YouTube pre-roll ad as something that they have to waste 30 seconds on and ignore so they can watch the next One Direction video. And I think there is, you know, whereas if you are ex very old, you see, oh, somebody has sent this to me, um, they've taken the effort to contact me, I should look at it. Cause they, and it's a very different way of looking at the world, and there are several of them, and I think sort of recognising it's different for different people means different things work and different things are necessary. Okay, thank you very much. So I've got three questions. I've got, I'll take them all together so that we can answer them. I've got John there, <coughs> Lady in Green and Lady in Blue. So, John. Uh, apparently, John. Hello. I'm John. Uh, I'm specifically, I'm from the Medical Research Council, but I'm specifically not representing the Medical Research Council. Okay. So I think you all rather charmingly started by saying that it's entirely possible to have better care and privacy. But you're sort of, I think, being rather absolutist about these things. And yeah, many of the researchers that we deal with tend to say to us, well, actually, well, we're not interested in, in individuals, first of all, which is great. But if you think about it for just a second, there are clearly things like rare diseases, where actually it's like Sam's crossbow. It's virtually guaranteed that you're going to identify that individual. And my question really is, and it's a hard one, I'm afraid, well, there's going to be a compromise between absolute privacy and absolute improvement of care. So how much improvement of care are you willing to sacrifice to protect privacy and vice versa? So how would you personally decide if, I know you're not ethicists, but if you're not ethicists, who should decide? And how would you communicate that decision to the public so that they can come along with you with the journey? Very good. So some time to think about that. Or we go to the lady in the green. 
Um, I'm Liz Hoffman from Biomed Central, and we've been talking about the UK as though it's sort of an isolated country and there's no other countries involved. Um, but we've also mentioned the Nordic countries where they've been collecting this data for I'm not sure how many decades. Do we have a best practice example that we can use or a worst practice example we can use to decide what we should be doing? Because nobody's talked about any actual existing examples. Okay, very good question. Thank you. And the lady here. Thank you. Um, Tanvi Desai, one of the directors at the Administrative Data Research Network. And one of the things that's, that I'm kind of is kind of ongoing worried about. There was a statement made early on in the piece where it said, are health data special? Yes. I've got concern about that because I think that attitude leads to putting health data in a silo. And actually a lot of the, the issues around data protection are common to all data. And a lot of the challenges facing our society at the moment are absolutely on the socio-medical kind of link. Mm. So saying health data is special and removing it from that kind of whole spectrum, I think is potentially very damaging to improving our society and to research that will kind of really give value. So I think kind of saying that health data in a way that it's an easier sell. It's easier to say to the public, if you make your health data available, I can make your life better than saying, if you give me your tax data, I can make your life better. It's a much easier sell. It's not necessarily true that only health data can do it. So I really think, how can we start thinking about data as a spectrum more widely rather than individual types of data okay. separated? Okay, very good. So three last questions there. So we heard, um, are we being too absolutist about it? When you're in rare disease cases, will you, what, how much uh, privacy will you trade for better care? Is anyone else doing this better than us in the world? And this issue of the, it's a spectrum and actually health and social care is a porous boundary between them. We may not think of them as Special. So, who would like to start me off on that? Thank you. Um, is somebody else doing it better in the world? Hopefully, because we're screwing it up. Um, <laughs> in terms of rare diseases, those cases people have a you know, great deal of treatment, and you actually have more time to talk about particular things, especially when, for very rare conditions, the people that are treating you are the same people who are doing the research, because there's only five people on the planet who do it, and it's that small. And possibly on the final depressing note, the NHS is actually not worse at using data than anyone else in government. We just noticed first and cared more, but it's a case of the National People Database with 20 million citizens in it. You really don't want to know where they sent it, and you don't really, you can't because they didn't really keep track. Um, and it's a case of it's probably not a good thing, but I think what we do in the health space will influence what we do elsewhere. Peter. Okay, so, so on John's interesting question around are we being absolutist, um, I, I think rare disease is a really interesting area because it, it, it illustrates a key point. It's about context, actually, because I, I know a lot of people with sort of rare diseases area where actually they absolutely want their data to be used. They absolutely want it to be used because actually there's no way they're going to get a cure otherwise or, a, or at least a treatment path. And they are probably one of the strongest lobbies in that space. So it goes to that relative of, of, of sort of, of, of context about where you are in your, you know, if you're a healthy 50-year-old who doesn't have any problems and you go <coughs> running every day and you don't see the doctor for years on end, then fine, great. You probably have no context of really interested in that. I have to say, as getting older, you have more interest. Um, <laughs> But, but I, I think where you've got specific diseases like that, cancer is a good example, heart disease, you know, all of these diseases where people have a very clear interest, there's a very clear uh, context for it. And I, I, I think then the trade-offs change in some respects, actually. And we have to respect people's wishes in that respect. And where rare disease is concerned, the lobby in terms of the patient population is very strong. So I think there is a, there is a deal there. How would I make that? I'd probably make it on that basis that if I personally was affected, I'd have, I'd have a different view than generally. Uh, but I'd like to hope that generally I'd contribute my data because it's a worthy thing to do for society. So that's the sort of, you know, going back to the, the moral dilemma of early. In terms of have we got a better role models, I kind of disagree with Sam <laughs> somewhat. I think, I think there are different, again, contexts of, of, of population and culture which sets up different types of arrangements in the world. And we can learn from a number of these, actually. Saying that, 
I don't think we're as bad as everybody tries to make out, and I'm really sorry about this. But, you know, if you think about it, we are one of the few countries that has a whole health system in, in, in its creation. Um, we have, uh, if you compare, you know, you've got 54 million records of live individuals, and then you add in all of that history data that's over the years that we've got. And actually, yes, there are issues, but there are issues in every system. What we need to do is learn what the best things to do and how we apply them. And actually, I don't think we're, 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 you know, we're not at the bleeding edge, but we're certainly leading quite a lot of this. And I think we should be proud of that, actually, as a, as a nation. Um, and briefly on the very on the third on the third question about Brief. the, briefly sorry uh, uh, the question about this dilemma um, uh, 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 the question seemed to say we talk about special cases not special cases I think we ought to differentiate between what is personal data and personal sensitive data and I think that's what you were trying to say earlier because actually personal sensitive data is different because it's personal sensitive data it has a different level of a view of it and that's what health data is considered to be. Um, and, and it's not about difference, it's about handling. And I think we've got to be really clear about that. So you put different handling mechanisms around it to make it more secure and more structured. I, that does not equate to utility of data being used for research and other things, because you can make those handling processes work. So I think we shouldn't talk about special, but we should very really understand the type of data we're dealing with. Thank you. Liam, briefly the last. Uh, so briefly, so the not being absolutist, I'd agree that it's probably possible for me or someone clever who works for me to take anonymised data and possibly identify people with very rare conditions or particularly unique combinations of things. Uh, why would they want to, uh, if they were doing it, for, I have no idea, if they were doing it for any malicious purpose whatsoever and weren't doing it for legitimate research purposes, they'd be committing a criminal act and there are all sorts of safeguards <coughs> against that. Uh, the Nordic countries, I think we can learn a huge deal from. Uh, in particular, I think, just this cultural norm that research will be done to benefit society. That's quite a short cultural norm. Um, <laughs> it's a good one. Uh, I was the one who said a health data special. I'm basing that on people's perceptions. I think people perceive their health data as being a special case. Um, and I think my argument would be, rethink that one. Uh, your tax data are pretty personal and pretty sensitive. I really, really hope the government are using your tax data to run the country. Because if not, we are really in trouble. Yeah, really in trouble. Okay. And in fact, I think you know they're using your tax data. And, you do, and people just don't object to that. Okay. I'm going to ask each of the panel to come back with a kind of closing thought. Um, they'd like us to leave the room with today. But before I do that, let me just have another last sort of straw poll of the evening. Ha after what you've heard today, how many people in this room would share their data for research? Anonymised. Oh, wow. Anonymised data. Excellent. Okay, a few more hands going up. Did, how many people have changed their minds since they came into the room? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> there's one there. Bad that lady. Thank you very much. Okay, so you, we were preaching to the converted. What's this? The last thought you'd like to leave our converted masses with, Sam? Let's start with you. Uh, so the Wellcome Trust report last week, which, if you want, an 200 pages of this stuff is riveting reading. Uh, is the idea of context collapse, which is you did something in one place, and it turns out it happened over there, and people get really, really unhappy about that. And you know, share your data research. What else have you shared it for, and is that a surprise? And the short takeaway is don't surprise patients. Okay, don't surprise patients. Peter? So I think, I think the debate has been really rich, and I think for me the, the key things from my sort of, uh, sort of thoughts around this are actually this educated dialogue about what we do with data and how we use data and what we get the benefits both as an individual society and the system get out of it is something we need to just engage with en masse because I think the more we do it the clearer the transparency gets and actually the more people want us to use data in the way that Liam needs it every day to get insight and understanding. Liam your takeaway thoughts? Um, takeaway thought would be I think I don't think it's an obligation but I think we all have a responsibility to use data to improve society, to use our own data to improve society. And we have, and as scientists and as clinicians and everyone else, we have a responsibility to look after people's data, keep it safe, keep it secure, keep it confidential. 
And that's our responsibility. And I think we, that's what we need to work on and keep working on. And it's, and it's never changing field. And we just need to keep at it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. That's the end of this evening's proceedings. I'd like to thank you all for coming this evening and for your great questions and really interesting debate. I'd like to say a special thanks to Eleanor Sherwood, who I'm delighted to say is an MRC fellow, hurrah, um, for organising uh, this event. And thank you to the British Library for running this great series of events. And most of all, uh, thank you very much to our panel for their comments and their, for their robust uh, discussions. So would you thank, join me in thanking the panel. Thank you.